Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Jason. Thank you, Carol. I appreciate you uh, handing it over to me. And I just want to personally thank SANS for allowing us to present today. And then uh, all of you who uh, took out your time in the day to attend, uh, really appreciate you stopping by to hear what we have to say. So I'm going to kind of kick this off uh, just with a little bit of a background for those of you who don't know me. Um, as mentioned, uh, I'm Vice President of Awake Labs. I run a incident response and managed network detection and response practice. So the, the topic of today, which is about a SOC, uh, we actually run a SOC for our managed network detection response, and I'm ultimately accountable for that. So that provides a little bit of relevance here. In my past, I, I've done work with NYU. I've been a forensic judge and a, a red team judge last year. I'm an advisor at Rutgers uh, on their cybersecurity program and done some other uh, advisory work that I'm also part of also had the, the good honor of writing exams for uh, both the CISSP and the ISMP content. And uh, ma many, many years ago, I, I held roles as a uh, CISO for a convention and also, uh, you know, a, more than a, about a year term as a transitional CISO for a large organization. I think the biggest relevance you'll, you'll see is I've been more than 15 years a work from home practitioner. So the shift really had a you know, probably a little effect on me from, from that aspect, other than uh, some of the, the normal challenges we're all running into. But uh, I'd like to take today and really kind of share some of the, the things, you know, we do here at Awake, as well as some of the other people I've talked to. So we know we're, we're in a very challenging time. Many of us have been through probably recessions, uh, myself been through the dot-com boom and bust at some level, uh, you know, we had Y2K for, for several of us, but, you know, this, this is very new to a lot of us, it's probably caused the biggest shift in technology and remote workforce that we've ever seen. And one of the things that I really want to do is sort of provide some background of how I came to this presentation and what I, I got from others. I, I spent quite a bit of time talking to you know, multiple CISOs, multiple SOC directors and managers, and then uh, several analysts to, to really get a good grounding of, you know, what challenges are you running into? How are you moving your organization to the next step, seeing that we're, we're now 30 plus days into this effort? And I really want to thank, you know, different people from industries I've talked to. I, I've talked to different people in government from, you know, state, local, and federal. I've talked to, to different organizations in the event planning landscape, multiple startups, and then, uh, you know, different healthcare and finance, and, and not just regionally located. Some of those are, are global. And, and, you know, they, they really did help me out quite a bit with this. So, so any of you who are out there who helped me, I really appreciate you taking the time to, you know, one, discuss with me and then answer some questions that, that really helped drive some of the, the core challenges that sometimes as practitioners we can't see ourselves. So as we walk into the presentation, and all of you saw this detail in the abstract, I'm really going to focus on each of these key topics and kind of keep it to a pretty structured format of two items here. One is giving you the challenges in each of these areas, and then also focusing particularly on solutions and how you move forward. So each of these offers a unique item that, that the recent you know shift in the remote work from home has uh, not just with the SOC but also with security and how the SOC works with security. So, so we're going to take each one of these categories, walk through them, and I'm really going to shed some of those different experiences that I've had as well as some of the, the individuals I've talked to and then and we're going to talk about how we move forward. And the goal here is to leave you with a, a, a good presentation on, on different concepts as well as something when you get the slide deck, there, there's a lot of items in depth that we're not going to go into on this call necessarily, but you'll have them all listed. So there, there's quite a few slides of, of some detail based on all the, the challenges and, and solutions we know that exist out there. So to kick this off, 
and really kind of get in. I, I'm going to talk about sort of the landscape before we get into the the problems and everything. And when when you look at just the overall picture of everything, you, you have sort of this three type of functional organization shift that, that had to change their environment. And each one of them had their own challenges at some level, um, some easier than others. And I consolidated this to, to just a very simplistic model of we, we've got those large organizations that are, are brick and mortar at some level. And these are these are your companies that in many cases might be very large. They, they've had most of their employees come into the office. They, they tend to work standard shifts. And um, if they had anybody working remote, they, they likely were possibly contracted for a, a certain portion of days. Uh, they, they had separate remote contracts in place that had to be there uh, to kind of govern it. But it was very light when you look at the overall company. It, it tended to encourage people coming in. It, it really wanted to build that company culture. I mean, these, these companies have cafeterias. They, they have gyms, they have, you know, full amenities to really kind of keep you on a campus at some level and try to provide a good work-life balance as well as, you know, a really good, you know, work environment itself. And and you'll see there, there's lots of items that have now come into a, a challenge for, for a, a brick and mortar at some level because they, they really facilitated a, a good work-life balance, uh, providing a lot of that at work. The second type are these hybrid organizations, and we have quite a few who exist today in this and have been moving more cloud-enabled, and even Awake itself is probably more of a hybrid. And you have a main corporate office, your your human resources, maybe your engineering, uh, some of your other back office, you know, manufacturing, things like that have to, to work in some type of location or, um, you know, some type of office structure at some point. And then you've made some type of shift to the cloud where certain resources are hosted out of there, certain um, applications, interactions with third parties, all that may be cloud-based. So you're, you're running this hybrid, which in itself, uh, you know, is a shift you've probably been going through and then learning how to deal with and how to monitor different things. And, and then you have this fully cloud-enabled. And, and, you know, I, I don't... I think this presents a smaller portion of companies out there, and, it, and it's been fairly difficult for a lot of companies to get to fully cloud enabled. But what we'll see is there's a lot of lessons from sort of that fully cloud enabled that we can learn from and actually look to, to leverage as those individuals have been doing things in, in this fashion for quite a while. So just to break down all three and kind of understand what's happened, when you look at the cloud enabled workforce you know outside of just a few different items it's pretty much business as usual for most of them i mean there, there are challenges economically and you know with stress of family and sitting at home and things like that but again from a security point of view and from a SOC point of view everything was already remote so, so in terms of handling this from a security point of view the, the stress level in the cloud environment is it's not that significant, you know, they, they were already dealing with it. So it, it, it's, it, you know, they, they've been in this space and not necessarily a challenge. When you look at the hybrid organizations, you start to see some level of stress level increase. Um, one of the more interesting things, you know, that I've seen is if you had really big engineering teams that were in one location and used to working from, from home, um, you know, similar to, to big security teams working in one location, such as a, a big stock if you had it. The, the challenge and some of the stress is these individuals are used to coming into an office. They, they don't know how to run the business the same way. So the collaboration in that, and we'll, we'll talk to those challenges, that they really are sort of a problem when people are used to sitting in office meetings, they're used to going into conference rooms, whiteboarding out their problems, and now they're, they're forced into a much more stressful situation that's causing overlap. And it's just a really, you know, change at some level, both mentally, technologically, that, that people are having to deal with. And then, you know, again, off the charts, brick and mortar, 
uh, th this is just a phenomenal change for these type of organizations that it is really kind of setting back and having them evaluate how the entire future of the org at this point needs to operate because you jumped into something and in lots of cases that I've seen in most organizations I've talked to, a significant amount of security controls have been relaxed uh, to enable their workforce. I, I mean, you know, simple things like two-factor fobs, things like that, you can't get them to people. So you have to drop the single-factor security. Um, you know, you're struggling to get enough equipment out. You know, are you letting them use home equipment? We'll, we'll talk to all of these different items. But the stress level of not only the org itself from many aspects, but also the, the level of items coming into the SOC and, and security team is just, again, off the charts for everyone in those type of organizations as it's been fairly difficult to shift certain things. And now you're, you're, you're living with what decisions you made and, and have to start moving forward in something that can address that. So I'm going to take a minute and just pause and let everybody read this. Uh, this is this has been a um, this has been interesting. I think it's been probably 16, 17, maybe 20 years since I forwarded a chain mail uh, message anywhere, and this came to me through a chain mail, and I, I just thought it was funny and, and really relevant to the conversation. So I'm just going to take a minute and be, be quiet and let you read it, and then I'll, I'll talk to it. But uh, I mean, this really is kind of the reality a lot of us might live in today. And as you're getting through this, you know, I'm even going to tell you about as a work from home employee, you know, something that's not pointed out here, but absolutely hit my team. And, you know, we, we were pretty well set for this. But, but what I, I realized is even though you're completely set and you ran a virtual sock at some level, uh, almost entirely, there are challenges even not addressed on this page, but, uh, you know, anyone who's got kids and other family working from home, the the challenge a lot of individuals, including ourselves, ran into is the attention of time that could usually be put into work became a problem at some level, meaning, you know, the teachers are only able to teach your kids so many hours a day, so you, you get interruptions. Um, you know, you've got multiple people on your home network stressing things, and you know, if you're shifting to become that teacher or, you know, having to enable everyone else in your house on technology at some level, you'll see it actually affects the productivity level of a security analyst, too. And that, that's probably the one item that I, I've seen through my team is we had to kind of learn and make some shifts, several of us, to how do we, how do we get back to the standard schedule and, and keep the productivity up? So, again, really kind of a key there. Let's jump into each of these challenges and really start talking a little bit to them. So the first one I'm going to go through is, is the asset visibility challenges. And I, I break everything down into kind of the, the most important five that are in the area. And by no way is this a comprehensive, you know, list of everything. In fact, when I was talking to all these organizations, what I realized was there's so many problems and not a lot of solutions. And as I started going through this, I started realizing I need to actually start focusing more on how are you solving this moving forward because it, it, it just, it, the same problems were being mentioned over and over again. And, you know, when you roll those up in the asset world, you know, the number one issue, especially when you look at some of the brick and mortar was onboarding and distribution of, of equipment. Um, you know, there, there's this really pr big problem with that. And, and you know, it's it's going to challenge. The second one is uh, use of personally owned assets. Third, looking at legacy and hard to move equipment. So, so this is one I'll focus on here before I jump into some of the others. But uh, any of you who had you know analog phones, physical phones, and you 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 may have even had them in the houses wired up, especially if you're in government. You may have had analog phone lines for some of your staff that were considered critical not all, and if you've got secure communication lines or you're trying to figure out how to forward those, um, those are some significant struggles that, you know, I'm not gonna say are easy to solve. I mean, there are remote phone solutions, but if you have to have secure lines and things like that, you know, they may not always solve those problems. And there are, you know, soft phone solutions that can, can deal with that, but you're, you're being forced to kind of look at assets at a different level. And do you have to really get on a plan to shift analog phones to people's houses, things like that? 
and, and those are not short-term solutions. Um, and then just a massive amount of unmanaged devices connecting. And, you know, the, what I call is the soft visibility challenge. You, you had situations where, you know, people just made decisions and tried to enable the workforce, and now you're sort of dealing with non-standard solutions. So let me jump into detail at some level, and I'm going to be very cautious on how I go through these slides. This is meant to be sort of twofold. Um, I, I wanted to give you a deck that had a take home kind of format and not be laborable going through every bullet here. So, so as that, you know, these slides are going to be available at the end and you'll be able to go through all of these. But what, what I want to talk to is a couple of the key things. So the distribution is probably one of the number one items that certain orgs struggled with. And I can tell you one of the scenarios I ran into was People who had desktops, they needed to eventually purchase laptops and get them out to all their employees. And, and you know, the decision one of the groups I, I talked to made was they actually sent all the laptops centrally to their corporate office, and then they made every one of their employees come in and pick them up. Okay, when you're in an environment and you're trying to avoid going out, you know, I would challenge you to think methods like that. Is that really appropriate? Is it not? And when you're a remote employee, what I can tell you is when we distribute equipment, uh, almost always will we ship it to the individual, um, especially if they're not coming for orientation or they're doing remote orientation, we would ship it to them. And one of the things I found most organizations were not thinking about in the distribution of equipment is you've already got the equipment out there at some level, maybe you're still dealing with it, um, but you're, you're figuring that process out. So there's no there are concerns with that, and there's lots of things in here that address it, but, but I think what you're going to run into next, if you haven't really looked at it, is, you know, if the economy is bad, a lot of us are going to go through certain level layoffs, things like that, and you're also going to just have regular attrition. And one of the things not being really thought through in a lot of the groups I talked to was, what do you do now to get the assets back, and how are you reprovisioning them into the environment? So, so distribution becomes a challenge at that level and one of the things I would suggest is look at how you're centralizing or sort of hub setting up distribution centers for receiving and sending out assets making sure they're clean provision before they're redistributed um, you know forensic analysis is going to come in at some level with where do you ship those and that's something I want everybody to think about and try to get ahead of because you are going to run into how am I now getting assets back meanwhile you're trying to already deal with your current problems in the entire uh, shipping process or whatever and, and getting security software on that. But as a SOC, you're now going to have these assets that one, you might not have people looking at them. Two, they might be residing in people's houses and being figure out how you're shipping and re redistributing them, or they might be being used for other purposes if you're not collecting them. Um, if we, we look at other items on here, um, you know, the, the other real big key thing when you look at kind of the visibility from the SOC, you had these decisions, again, really pushed down from president, governor to your exec, and got all this data out there. Now you're having to deal with the detection, response, and remediation on them. Uh, one of the things you really need to do is start looking at and analyzing each business unit and how that affected them, because some of the stories I heard were, you know, tablets uh, being used as hotspots and all kinds of things like that to install VPN on different software because, you know, we had to get out a purchase order or something like that. And, you know, maybe they didn't even have a work device. So they're, they're doing stuff like that. And your business units possibly got some level of control to do that. And one of the, the best solutions I heard out there, uh, especially if you're in a large org, was the security team and the SOC came up and they analyzed how big this problem was fairly quickly. Um, and they, they essentially set up a regular cadence of meetings for the business managers. And what they did with that was they just started listening both sides. What challenges do you have with productivity? What do, you, what do we need to get in front of you? And it turned out there were a lot of tools in the organization that could actually solve some of these problems, but the business wasn't aware. Um, we had problems with shipping to unknown people and that people didn't know how to get the assets, things like that. So, you know, as a stock, you're going to want to get that analytics and get it back into your executive team where you, that piece probably broke down and really get back in front of the business team, get the challenges again, just like you, you did day one when you were an original 
you know, functioning company when new business units come on and get in front of it. And, and that's going to be the key to really trying to get a handle on that. And, and again, it's not a short-term solution. It's something you just process-wise have to adapt to moving forward. The, the number one challenge probably for most SOC teams uh, as they shifted from, uh, you know, a traditional SOC to remote was communications. And in general, it was daily communication and coordination that, that was the, the problem. Uh, you know, you, you got shift transitions that were used to individuals sitting next to each other. And, you know, you could talk from one chair to another. And, and now that that's not necessarily there. You've also got a slew of entire new security issues. And, and then, you know, you got too many incidents possibly coming in. You're, you're delayed on investigations, all, all kinds of items. And then I'm going to talk specifically to what about those third party services and third party SOCs you're interacting with for your own technology and how is that coming into play, which is possibly a big risk a lot of you aren't thinking about. Um, so when, when you break down the daily and kind of the, the, the shift transition, um, one of the things unique about my career is uh, when, when I worked back at um, one of my companies that it was really pretty advanced in security, I ended up going to engineering for several years and uh, worked on orchestration and things. But what, one of the benefits of that was I learned how engineering teams work. And ever since I came out of there, I've adapted a lot of my remote strategy to some of their methods. And when you look at that, I'll go through what I've heard companies say work and what they don't. And then I'll talk to my, my own team and how we do that at some level. But from some of the organizations, there, there's, essentially setting up a, a WebEx or Zoom, and Zoom today has its own complications, which, you know, I'm not going to get into, but we all know that. I mean, even this morning, I think everybody had an update uh, at some level. But, you know, they're leaving these meetings up all day long and essentially muting their SOC, but that way they have full collaboration. People can come on at any time. Um, you're going to see chat is going to be a huge, you know, benefit. I mean, you know, I've worked at companies where, if they're running incidents, they set up a new chat for every incident and they essentially run it down at some level. Um, you know, mobile phones, if you are still struggling with phones, there, there's lots of mobile software platforms out there that can set up ring groups that can hit your PC or your regular phone. They can be forwarded. They also have chat, stuff like that. So they can take the entire collaboration for you if you haven't dealt with that. But one of the more important items, and it's mentioned in the second piece here under shift, is that engineering piece, which my team runs a scrum format okay and it's very simple every day and you don't necessarily need to do it every day I, i've ran you know every couple of days in, in many cases too but you set up a 30 minute meeting and what you do is say what are you doing today do you have any blockers how can i help you i mean it, it, you keep it short you keep it simple but what this does is it gets the entire team in sync you recognize the problem and you can shift individuals to solve those problems immediately and that, that's sort of an engineering mindset, but it works very good for how you're running your SOC and keeping in line with everybody. Um, the other thing is engineering uses a lot of collaboration platforms. And, you know, I mentioned a few on there, but you got things like Confluence, OneNote, Teams. They're all very effective at keeping shift logs, things like that, as long as you are connecting at some level to understand what's going on. So our challenge is, the big challenge with that is, don't use all three of them if you have them. Get everybody on one centralized collaboration platform. Otherwise, you'll struggle with data being in too many places, too. Um, and then when you look at, as we move forward into the same thing, uh, the same section of communication, the one significant gap that I've seen a lot of companies haven't really been digging into is what about third-party SOC operators that you have, okay? you might have forgot they all have everybody working from home too and how secure are they and did they just increase an entire new risk segment into your entire security operation you know you spend a lot of time trying to figure out how you're analyzing data how you're doing forensics are your home environment secure do you have the right equipment and you're probably still struggling at some level with that yourself what about your third party how are they doing this have you even checked at their security level so as you're shifting out of this first 30 days, I, I would encourage you all to start looking at those third party providers and, and sort of doing a reassessment of how did this change your security posture? You know, 
and get back in front of these processes with both your business units and these third parties to make sure you're sort of recycling back and bringing up your posture uh, where it likely just went very weak and you may not have been looking at it. As we continue to kind of drive down these, uh, I'm going to dig into the insecure home network and, you know, there's, there's a lot of key items here that, you know, we're all probably struggling with at some level and, and some things are simple to solve, some are not. When you look at use of home equipment for work, uh, you know, I guarantee it's happening. The large you are, it's definitely happening. And one of the interesting things we found just ourselves in doing analysis at the network layer, even before for this was that 40% of file sharing is done outside of the network even before the remote shift. So if you can imagine that, you're already probably crossing that 50% threshold of what's being shared of stuff now outside of the environment. So use of home equipment and, and other things are gonna come into play. And I'll talk to more of that cloud situation, a little bit of how some of these are being shared. Um, printing of sensitive data, that that is just, uh, that just baffled me at some level. I mean, if you're a top secret employee, you're in an R&D environment, you've got critical formulas, things like that, and you're now working at home. I mean, ask yourself, why are you printing data? Like, really? You, you, you're the only one there unless you've got people coming over to your house. And, you know, that, that, that brings a big challenge. But what I, I realized is likely the reason you're printing it is probably because you can't read it. <laughs> so, this will bring into a challenge of how do you deal with that? And I mean, you know, it may require bigger monitors, things like that at home. But, uh, you know, you really want to make sure your employees aren't doing that. And again, get in some type of visibility into that area. Um, then you have vulnerabilities. We saw the Cisco vulnerability that, that happened. Um, a lot of devices you just pushed out there likely don't have any of the security features. They may have been ordered by business units. You probably had to rush to get them in place. You may have not been able to get standard images, locked down of different things. And then you also have other individuals in the house that can bring, you know, insecure challenges to the environment. So when we break these down and you look at sort of the, the use of, of home equipment, um, you know, I'm going to give a, a really good example. Many of you may have just banned Zoom at some level across the board because of the vulnerability landscape of it, if that was even possible in some orgs anyway, you may have banned it. But what about all the third parties that your team still needs to interact with Zoom? Are you now setting up every one of those sessions with your own software? Probably not. You probably still have them doing Zoom. You're still on these. And, you know, if it's not okay to use that, you know, it's going to be really hard for you to detect that without sending out some type of notification or figuring out an alternate solution that you can support technically in your environment. And, um, you know, that, that's, a, that's a struggle. And then in addition to the home equipment, you know, the big thing you're going to want to look at doing is really getting your VPN technology up to date. I, I can't tell you the most stress on every org I've heard is putting in additional VPN technology. Um, you, you've probably had lots of challenges around getting in the technology if you haven't already, uh, monitoring that environment, and then also now you have to make decisions on do you force everyone through it and, and how do you, you deal with that? Um, you know, if you can't force them through it, if they're going to the cloud, can you put things like VPC taps on and monitor the cloud environment so you can see non-standard devices uh, connecting to the network? So there's lots of challenges there. There's, there's lots of ways to solve those problems but they do require technology investment at some levels to do that. And then, you know, if we continue to look at the other challenge you have out there with security features on laptops, for example, you know, you're going to want to go back as these work devices are now on the network and, and look at them, you know, what, what's their BIOS level security, what's their endpoint encryption, you know, um, do they allow USBs to be connected? If you're, if there's sensitive data on them, you know, did you even have DLT before this? How, how are you dealing with that? And then do you have anything that can actually monitor interactions for use of, you know, passwords and stuff now going throughout the network likely to log into all these new services and systems? Can you pick that up at, across the enterprise at any level? So, so you've got a lot of different security features that you really need to go back and reassess and get with the business units to make sure you're trying to capture that. Um, one of the more important things I've seen on 
the security features, and I, I think I talked this a little bit later, is, you know, if you don't have naming conventions of your uh, departments and that when you deploy systems, this challenge is going to be a lot harder. So you want to try to get in front of standard naming conventions for types of devices, who's got privileges, stuff like that. Uh, it, it's going to significantly help, and then you, you might be able to look at how you apply controls at that level in, in, in a prioritized fashion if you didn't have that in place. So that, that's something to consider as you're going forward. Now, just continuing down the path uh, of some of these, and we talked to the end user education. And if any of you were lucky enough about two weeks ago, Sam put out a, a, a great guide on some of the, the home stuff. So if you, if you haven't read or looked at that, you know, I would just, you could probably just search for it and see if it, but there's a great guide that Sam's put out there on some of the work for home practices that you can do. But in addition to that, you're running into just, a significantly increased risk landscape and also your users themselves who've been in a protected corporate environment really don't know the risks of their own home. Um, you know, you, you're going to run into employees who just, they don't, they don't understand it. They, 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 they get the phishing at work. They have ways to deal with that. But now you're talking about an entire new shift of, Wow, this whole threat environment of you know data loss, all this just became a complete new shift that's brand new to them, and and they don't know it. You might think that's common knowledge, but it's really not going to be for a lot of these employees. So you got to keep that in the back of your mind. And one of the ways as a SOC, you can help drink, bring down your alerts, your your challenges, is you you got to get this knowledge back out around and help the the population again. Your users, your best ally here and your biggest weakness in some cases, you, you got to get them the knowledge. Um, shadow technology, we, we know, is, is a struggle. And then now you've got all these new, you know, attack vectors possibly coming into the home with, you know, default passwords on stuff. And what if they actually use the same password at work as they did at home, which everyone knows somebody did. And, you know, now are they able to get in if you don't have the right, again, endpoint security controls on the PC itself? as well as you know how it's logging in your environment and then you know data leakage if you don't allow them to print but you allow them to take data off the system through usb don't assume they're not printing through one of their other you know solutions in the house um you know there there's also other things like the, just cloud infrastructure if you don't enable them with collaboration correctly that 40% of data that was going outside likely is significantly increasing of, hey, let me just put it up on my G drive. Let me just, you know, put it up on OneNote and you can access it there. Let me just email from my home account. All things that, especially financial organizations have spent years locking down, now potentially are, are open areas that, that you're gonna have to deal with. And I'm hearing there's are a major challenge for many organizations. And then, the other assumption I think a lot of us make is that the remote users know all the tools that the, that the previous remote users knew, and they likely don't. So they're using these solutions because of the lack of education of what exists in the corporation at some level. So when you, when you sit down and look at the increased risk landscape, you, you, you really got to get a guidance packet out to everybody and, and training. Just like you do basic security 101 when you onboard people, you've now got to get, you know, sort of a remote onboarding solution in that. And as I mentioned, the SAMS guide earlier, if you don't know where to start, that'll give you a great uh, area to start. We've got some other things on the slide here that, that help with it, but, but you really got to shift to that, you know, security 101 for remote users because they just don't know the problem. They also don't know how your company has already solved that likely with collaboration tools, with things, you know, maybe they have access problems, you are not aware of uh, items like that. So this gives a format for being able to, again, shift them over to the tools to solve the problems as well as educate them of things not to do in their home and also how to maybe improve their security in their home. So a lot of, a lot of pieces there that can go together at, at some level. And this will go a long way with the amount of events and, and challenges you're running into. Um, what one of the, the craziest things that I saw is, you know, companies said, well, maybe we just protect their, their home assets. And uh, 
you know, I would tell you, consider that. I mean, if it's possible, there, there's something there. But let me tell you, that's a massive increase of scope for a stock. And I know a company I talked to did this. They, they dropped in an EDR agent on some home systems and they got blown up. Uh, I mean, it was a massive amount of alerts that came in just from their test pilot. They shut it all down. So, you know, thinking something like that is practical, it may be. Um, it depends on the size and how well you're outfitted, but it, it may not be a practical solution. So you are back to educating users. So it's important to point out things that we know haven't really worked well in the test landscape from the people I've talked to. And, you know, those of us who are remote, you know, we, we tend to look at our environment as we don't trust even our home environment at many levels, uh, anything in it, you know. So from my standpoint, I, I try to stay off of anything a lot of my other family members are on, stuff like that, so that, you know, you're, but your your common users not thinking of, of that. They're, they're still in the mindset that we're from the office. They print things. They review them separate, stuff like that. Um, so, so you got lots of things. Uh, the, the other piece here is if, if privacy in that is huge and you don't run DLP, uh, you know, you, you're gonna need to look at that technology and consider prioritizing uh, other solutions that may help with the privacy issues now. Um, and, and then again, I wanna just stress the last item on here. You've got processes and tools in place potentially. Are your users really, already using the things you had for your existing remote workforce and can they handle it? And, you know, if not, those are probably the biggest key things. Uh, the other thing I would encourage you is, you know, have a, a brown bag type talk or a business leader type talk and, and really kind of go through these solutions with the entire organization at some level. Uh, it'll help significantly reduce alerts as, as they come into the environment. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna shift uh, to something that 90% of the, the companies, probably 98% of the companies I talked to did not do and, and really hadn't addressed, which is the session planning. And for those of you who don't know my background, uh, you know, I worked a long time at one of the big uh, ex consulting firms and uh, I, I did several BCP business continuity um, engagements uh, for, for big organizations. I mean, large food providers, large um, government providers. And so I went through a lot of this disaster business process, pandemic type stuff uh, in the past. And, you know, one of the first things I, I kind of thought of for my own company was, hey, team, if somebody gets sick, you know, we need to figure out how we're dealing with that at some level. Uh, and, you know, we put in a succession plan in place. And, and you know, but when I talked to a lot of other groups, no one had considered the stock having a succession plan. And, you know, that, that's a, a key problem. So I would suggest get one in place. Um, you know, tasks and activities, they're, they're going to be a little bit different from home and the office. So even if you had an existing plan and you happen to be part of a, a BCP exercise that involved you to do this, it's going to need updated because you likely just shift your activities tasks and who's responsible. So make sure you get that updated. Um, one of the common problems of, even your existing one also may be contact information. Um, and, and then, you know, do you have enough resources? And what if you're already got individuals out sick? So when we break these down, you know, I, I encourage you all to, to get out a, a plan. I mean, honestly, if you need one, I can figure out how to get you a template at some level. So, uh, you know, I would just say ping me on Twitter if you need to, and I'll, I'll figure out how to get you a template at some level or point you to one that's public you can use. Um, the emergency contacts, you really got to get the emergency contacts for uh, your SOC team. So if they've got relatives, family, neighbor nearby, you know, they may not show up at work one day. If you're not preparing for that right now, you're potentially going to be down a member and then you're going to be struggling and you may have no way to even figure out what happened to them. So get the emergency contacts in your succession plan um, and make sure you're covering that. And, and, you know, it's, it's super important. And if you've already got people out sick, I'm sure you're feeling some of this at some level. So, again, you really got to consider cross-departmental solutions in your, your item. Like here at Awake, I've got two different departments and back up for threat hunting at some level. Um, you know, I've got other groups I can reach out to for forensics if we really needed to for incident response. And you need to be thinking of that as an organization, especially if you have employees in you know, massively infected areas. So, so just again, items that you may not be thinking of, try to get those on your plate. Now let's shift into incident response. 
And I've had the unique ability of doing remote forensics and incident response for quite a long part of my life uh, at this point. And I mean, we've gotten really pretty effective at it. And there's lots of companies today that are pretty effective at remote incident response. And I'm sure if you've had an incident, some of you experienced that on one side or another, or you do it yourself remote. But uh, I think the one thing that, that is the challenge today is what I call the kind of the new remote insider threat. And um, we'll talk to that specifically on the next slide because that, that's a new challenge that you might not be dealing with. You've obviously got architecture gaps at some level, uh, offline devices, you know, those come into challenge and uh, chain of custody opens up a whole new fun situation. I mean, if you've really got somebody who is suspect and you're trying to acquire their, their system, uh, you know, if they know they're on their suspect, what's the stop from wiping it before they send it to you? You know, those are, those are some real challenges uh, when it comes to custody and how you can deal with them. You're likely going to see because devices are at home, they're going to get broken, they're going to get stolen possibly from different things. Um, you know, they might get water damage, things like that. So you've got challenges at that level too. And then you've got all these unmanaged remote forensic artifacts that they may be connecting to your network now and how do you deal with that? So if we break it down, um, let's talk about this sort of remote insider threat at some level. And, and you know, the, the, the real challenge there is the economic of the companies are changing right now and uh, you know there are layouts happening and they're going to continue to happen uh, based on just the, the change in how we're living in, in the landscape economically it, and the, the big problem with that is you've now got all these terminations some people are going to get angry they're they're going to get frustrated um, you know do you even have a way to deal with that at some level uh, if you're trying to acquire forensics or device maybe offline half the time, are you really going to allow them to connect back online to perform a forensic analysis? Um, you know, there's ways that you can get around that if you need to. And, and I think the number one thing I would tell you is your containment and remediation plans, if you have them today, you're likely not looking at remote and unmanaged playbooks. And what I mean by that is, okay, We've got somebody, they've, they've got a problem. What is the plan to acquire their data stealth-wise if we, you know, so we don't alert them? How do we do it off the network if that's even possible? You know, do we involve legal HR, all that? You really need to kind of flush out those playbooks and, and make sure you've thought through those different scenarios. That, you know, I mean, I've heard solutions of, we'll call them with the lawyer, we'll bring in the forensic experts and we'll drop the software on their system. That's great unless the person doesn't want to cooperate, you know, I mean, uh, and I've had others send authorities over to their house in the last 30 days. So, uh, I mean, you've got, you've got all kinds of different things like that that can come into play, but then there's also other mechanisms if they do connect, how are you monitoring that they connect so you can get the, the forensic data quickly, stuff like that that, that comes into the play. Um, when you also look at the unmanaged and, and remote forensic artifacts, the last uh, piece on the the lower level here, you, you run into a couple of the key things and um, logging is going to be your friend. Uh, I mean, I think everybody stresses logging all the time, but what about your cloud infrastructure? You know, I can tell you when we get called in on Office 365 type events, you know, first thing we want is logs and, uh, you know, people don't have them. And you're going to have to think about that on all your cloud infrastructure because that's what they're connecting to, especially when they're not on their devices. You know, you got third parties that may run and own those logs. Again, this goes to that remote sock. You know, how, how did you iron this out with them? How are you getting those logs quickly? Who's accessing them on their side? Are they working at home? What's their security thing? So, so you're going to want to look at things like logging. Um, other thing is network monitoring. Can you on these, can you put in taps at the cloud level across your network, your VPN area to actually monitor this and enforce everybody through the VPN? And then now you're going to have to come up with these new playbooks for how you're pulling that evidence back for these areas. So, so again, kind of a shift in mentality where you've been. And I can tell you when I first came to Awake, the, the network and unmanaged playbook scenario of almost every customer I dealt with uh, didn't exist. So I'm sure all of you are dealing with that problem today uh, almost across the board because you know, even being in endpoint forensics and different things like that, most people were never thinking of the network and unmanaged playbook scenarios until of you know, recent in many cases. 
the last one is monitoring and managing risk. And uh, I'm going to try to get through this one and my next few slides in a couple minutes and leave some time for questions here. But we, we've got, you know, challenges with detecting malware. We've got complications in some of your network traffic that, that affects some of the network monitoring. Um, log formats, inconsistent log formats. If you're now shifting the new things like your VPN, you know, if you don't have standard formats and all that, it, it's, it's causing problems. As a SOC, you really got to get back and uh, on with your technology groups and get them to, to standardize that stuff. Um, number four is key here, and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of talk to that on the next slide. And then, you know, what about vulnerability scanning and, and you know, updates with offline devices? So, so when we dig into these a little bit, you know, the, the complications in network traffic, you, you're going to have a lot of people natting through the VPN, and if you don't have ways to detect things, you know, through encrypted traffic at some level, that, that's going to be difficult. Or if you're, you know, not decrypting it, it becomes even more difficult. You may not have monitoring there. So there's lots of things that come into play, and, and there are solutions to that. Um, the other real challenge is how many of you have actually gone back and looked at all the firewall rules that just got open in the last 30 days to enable all this stuff and change? Uh, you, you need to get back in front of that. You need to go look at it. You've possibly opened up a bunch of new things to enable infrastructure. And uh, you may not be monitoring all those changes or looking at the new gaps. So, so really want you to kind of look at that area. And then the other real important item, and this gets harder as you get to be a larger organization, but you now have all these external IPs potentially connecting to your infrastructure. And just about the only type of organizations that are used to dealing with this are probably universities at some level where they've got a massive public space and they connect in and you know how do they deal with that and we all know challenges around that but when, when you look at all these home IPs they now become part of your internal structure at some level so, so when you're looking at it things like zero trust may come into play at some level where you've got to do additional validation of device and identity with two-factor and then other things that, that are really important to consider is you know, how are you actually tracking your current workforce's internal, um, uh, your, your internal external IP footprint? And, you know, how are you doing device trust measures and at least maybe IP? Those are things you might want to start thinking of depending on, um, you know, how challenging that problem is. So it's a pretty significant at some level. So I'm going to wrap it up here and just open it up to questions. But one of the things I want to talk about is, okay, lots of problems, lots of little things that we can think about, but how do we deal with this? And um, I'm going to kind of go back to that engineering experience and how you have to really sort of tackle this. We don't know how long we're going to be in it, but if, you, if you're if you not moving to adapt to it, you're going to continue to have gaps and, and open up the different challenges. Um, even this morning, I was thinking about, you know, all these businesses are shut down when they go open it up, whether, what, what's the posture look like? Um, but you want to get more agile. Okay, and, and by that, we, we've now been in here, you kind of got to accept where we're at. Uh, you really need to start, if you haven't already, look at the, the business change. How did it change? What's new boundaries? How do we determine what's relevant to measure? And you should be creating new dashboards, things like that, if you haven't already. Um, as we move forward, you, you're going to continue to educate and get the best practices out for your users across the board. And your SOC should be collaborating with other remote SOCs, especially if you've never been remote, and getting some of the knowledge, bouncing things off. Um, you know, I'm sure there's lots of people that share. Uh, if you're not a member of the COVID uh, task force that just got sent out, you know, that there's, I think, over 1,000, 2,000 people in there now. You know, there's lots of people to, to connect to, get data, get conversations on how individuals are doing it. And then, you know, look at the largest problems, start mitigating, and continue to measure uh, how effective it's been, and, and again, really shift into this very adaptive model where now, once we've got a little bit of handle on it, we're starting to hunt across these new attack vectors, um, you, you know, where we're able to start reporting problems through management change very well, getting the business to adjust and get their feedback, uh, you know, so, so we've got data to show them the problem, to help them take it on, to help executives now push it. And, and again, this is going to help you when you have to shift back to, because you're likely when you shift back, you're not going to be in the same posture. People are, some people are going to stay remote. They're going to realize benefits and disadvantages, and they're going to want to take a, um, you know, advantage of the good things from having people remote and um, probably keep some of them in place. So again, 
you know, this, this is a, a quick overview. We will provide the slides uh, to everybody. So you've got lots of different data um, in here. And, you know, absolutely, if there's any questions, things like that, I'll, I'll stop now. We can answer those questions. And, uh, you know, let's uh, go ahead and shift to that forum now, Carol, if you don't mind. All right, thanks for that great presentation. Uh, we do have some questions ready for the Q&A. However, if anyone has a question for Jason, please enter it into the questions window now. Our first one asks, how do we retrofit a zero trust architecture now? We weren't really in that mode before COVID-19 hit. Yeah, so, so zero trust architecture is obviously something talked about a lot and fairly difficult. and. I would look at it in two ways. Uh, one is you, you had all these threat models in place, and right now, if you're trying to leverage those exact, exact trust uh, threat models, that's, that's probably a bad idea. You, you need to go revisit some of your, your threat modeling and uh, make no assumptions about how secure or insecure things are. So that, that'll give you a, a first step into it. And then the second key thing that you're going to want to do once you've kind of gone through that threat model and realized there was probably a lot of shifts that you were assuming before, is you're going to want to look at how do you validate identity and device uh, in, a, in a new format. So, so meaning, is there a way I can profile and get like an entity IQ of a device? And is there a way I can, um, again, get the data associated with like the two-factor authentication and that to make sure I got the right person, I got the right device, and, and I'm not assuming any security mechanisms from them based on the threat model. All right, thank you. How can we find shadow IT applications on the networks, on the network since these are unmanaged by definition? This is some, uh, you know, being a network company, I have the, the luck of kind of understanding it. And one of the challenges most companies run into is when a device changes IP and, and does things like that, um, it, it becomes a little bit difficult. But when you look at the unmanaged items, first you, you've got to understand what's your managed uh, in, in situation, okay? So what assets do you actually manage out there? Ways you can typically figure that out is looking at your endpoint agents, uh, getting a scope on them from that aspect. And, and anything that's sort of outside of that sort of falls into that unmanaged category at some level. Now, the, the real challenge is, okay, so, so I've separated between what we've got endpoint on and what not, but now how, how do I know it's the same device when it's crossing subnets, things like that. There, there are network solutions and, and network items out there that can help you, you know, and it wakes is one of those that, that can actually profile the entity of devices across different subnets. Uh, it could actually pick it up through cloud and your VPN. So if you had somebody pick up on the VPN and then go to the cloud, we could actually tell that it's the same uh, endpoint coming through both vectors uh, through entity profiling. And there's other, um, you know, when you look at your network logs, there's, there's probably ways you can do that. It's, it's pretty painful to do it manually, though. All right, thanks. We have users sometimes coming in over the VPN and other times access line of, line of business apps directly. Any suggestions on how to correlate these devices, et cetera? Yeah, that, that's very similar to, to what I, I just said there. Um, and I mean, I think not in addition to the profiling at some level of, of the entity and the device, uh, you know, this, this goes back to one of the items I mentioned in, in the presentation too is, you know, the network visibility is one way that you can do that. Like if you can hook into VPC paths and all your, your um, VPN environment, you, you can correlate that stuff, but um, if that's not there, and let's kind of talk to the forensic investigation piece at some level, you, you have to have logs on, on both sides, um, and that's going to be the key way. And, and again, kind of tracking those external IPs as internal is another way. I, I mean, we've recently just dealt with some of these remote insider threats and absolutely ran that same scenario, and, and you know, we had to deal with logs and tracking of IPs across both sets and user counts and stuff. So again, two ways, network profile and or from a, a kind of a forensic and monitoring application uh, point of view on, on logging. All right, thanks, Jason. What are some of the key metrics you are providing execs on remote work during this COVID pandemic? Okay, can you say the last part of that again, Carol? What are the key metrics on 
Uh, what, are the, what are some of the key metrics you are providing executives, execs, on remote work during this COVID pandemic? So from a, a security point of view, some of the, the key metrics that I track are maybe different than some. I mean, you know, others are probably tracking things like how many um, how many unmanaged items are connecting, how many people don't have two-factor authentication, stuff like that. I tend to track more what questions are being asked uh, from users, and that's not always easy. But if you can get into ways to funnel uh, user questions and stuff, and I'll, this, this brings up a really good point of, of how you can do this that I didn't talk to, I believe it's in the slide deck. But um, you know, one of the, the solutions you can do is set up a couple of chats for the entire organization. I know that might sound crazy, but it's very effective. And, and things like report security event or ask questions, you can set up two separate chats like that, get them the whole or get them funneled in on that. And I can tell you what, the questions from users coming in are probably one of the most valuable metrics to try to measure because it actually helps you realize a problem you didn't have. And whereas, okay, I can monitor unmanaged connections, things I don't know, and those are important metrics to get a hold of some of the business unit problems, but you're going to fundamentally see the questions being asked are why that's happening. So it's a step earlier. So again, a little bit more unconventional than maybe stock people look at, but establishing that medium and being able to look at that medium and the metrics is actually very important to get underneath even the problem that you're seeing on the other end that you might be tracking. All right, thanks. I think we have time for another question. Uh, one of our challenges with the remote SOC is much of the knowledge is being lost in individual Slack channels or email threads. What suggestions do you have to keep that centralized and not lost? Yeah, that, that just goes to just telling you to solve my problem with Slack. Somebody's stepping on top of it. Um, <laughs> no. Um, you, you know, when you when you look at the, uh, the challenges with data being lost in, in you know, email or, or uh, chat. I mean, I can tell you email when you're remote is a very ineffective way to, to manage. And if you're managing everything in email, you're, you're probably struggling with the, this process right now at every level. Um, e email is great for, you know, larger communications, things that require action, stuff like that. Uh, but, you know, chat chat's probably going to be your friend. You're going to use that. And yeah, there's, there's going to be a lot lost there if you don't do something about it. So, some of the key things that I, I know organizations do that I talk to as well as, you know, I, I've used in the past, um, I, I mentioned the things like the, the teams, the one, the, you know, um, different things that you can share and collaborate. And the other I would tell you about is your ticketing software at some level. So some of you may use things like ServiceNow, Jira, those items. Um, we pretty much have implemented cultures in my team of, if it comes through Slack, it needs, and it's important, it needs to get on one of those collaboration sites and categorize, or it needs to get into the ticketing system. And if you're struggling with the whole team doing that, take one or two individuals and make it their job. Um, that's a, the easiest way to centralize it, either in your ticketing or in your collaboration platform. And again, the challenge you're gonna run into, if you don't pick one, they're gonna be in both, and you're gonna get them locked. And then you're gonna be wondering which platform is it in. So pick one, set it up as a key area, start categorizing it, put, make people do it, and then if it's struggling with the whole team, make one or two individuals accountable for, for putting those uh, key items in where required. Especially if they're like tuning items, notes that are important, you're, you're gonna need those when you're working different uh, investigations and you know, uh, dealing with alerts, you know, things like that, filtering. All right, thanks. We'll squeeze this last one in. What's the most effective way to implement a zero trust architecture in a university setting where most devices are unmanaged? <laughs> yeah, that's like the hardest one to answer, of course. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I mean, zero trust in a university is, is pretty complex, and, and I'm definitely not going to have a, enough time to to answer this, but, but what I'll tell you is how to start about that problem. Um, one is when you're looking at it, you, you got to prioritize the staff you're going to start implementing that infrastructure. You're never going to roll it out across the board day one. So you're going to look at, you know, critical systems and key faculty 
uh, are, are really where you want to start that architecture and sort of separate it from everywhere else. So again, start structuring the network, start structuring the validation and threat models around your key staff, your key uh, information such as grades and things like that that you're concerned about and architecturing from that standpoint. And then as you get your hands and you learn and you control that environment, you're going to want to roll out. And, and I know there's a lot more things we could add on to that, um, you know, so feel free to reach me offline if you want, and I can go into more detail. But that's how I would start approaching that problem in a university. All right. Well, with that, we are out of time. Thank you so much, Jason, for your great presentation and to Awake Security for sponsoring this webcast, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.